Hello and welcome back to Behind the Bar with me, Cara Devine, and for today, him, Fred Siggins, for part two of our chat all about Australian whiskey. If you missed part one, where we covered the history and heard a little bit more about Fred's whiskey journey, you can find a link to that in the description below. And definitely do check it out because there's a whole chunk of Australian whiskey history that I honestly didn't even kind of realize happened. But today you'll hear all about the whiskey revival that's been happening here recently. I'm introducing you to some new players and make sure you stick around because Fred's also got his very own Aussie whiskey cocktail that he wants to introduce you to. So I guess where we left off in our last episode, Bill Lark was in his waders fishing trout and thinking, why are we not making whiskey in Tasmania? And he then went and got the laws changed and started doing just that. Yeah, and so this was, um, you know, 30 odd years ago now. And for the first, really for the first 15 or 20 years, it was just a few very, very small scale distilleries like Lark down in Tasmania, kind of ticking away at it. Um, you know, and in the 90s, nobody was really that fussed on single malt whiskey. It wasn't nearly as trendy as it is right now. Yeah. So these distilleries stayed very, very small scale. But Lark Distillery in particular really kind of defined what Australian craft single malt would look like for that first 20 years or so. We're talking about a style of whiskey that is aged in small casks and generally with quite a lot of Australian fortified wine influence. So uh, Lark is really typical of that, generally using sort of 50 and 100 litre casks, aged for not quite as long as you would expect what the whiskey would be, in Scotland. What would your average cask size be in Scotland compared to that? So in Scotland, you'd be looking at usually 200 and 300 litre casks being pretty standard and sometimes up to 500 litres. So using the smaller casks basically means that you're gonna have a lot more oak influence in the whiskey in a shorter period of time. Mm. Uh, and I think for a lot of distilleries, um, that's, that's basically so they can get something in the bottle a bit quicker. But it also really has kind of come to define, at least, I, like I said, at least for the first 20 years or so, what that craft Tasmanian whiskey started to look like. Yeah. Um, so you have like a pretty oak forward style of whiskey. Uh, and that also has this real kind of like fudgy sweet chewiness from uh, the Australian fortified wine. So what we call a para here in Australia, which is basically Australian style sherry. Yeah, because um, that is a real character of that, like even stuff that's done in the style of a Montiato or whatever, like it mm -hmm. is that bit kind of richer and sweeter, I guess just because, again, because of the climate maybe, um, and, and just, and just the style, like it seems to be in a bit of an Australian palette thing. They just like kind of, big flavors, you know? Sure, well, I mean, you know way more about sherry and fortified wines than I do, so I couldn't necessarily tell you exactly why the Australian style of sherry tastes quite different from the European ones, but you're absolutely right that it definitely has that big influence on the whiskey. Uh, the other thing that's really important to remember about Australia is obviously our climate, even down in Tassie, which is the coldest part of Australia, is significantly warmer than Scotland. So your aging whiskey that's kind of made in a Scottish style because we're talking about malted barley and fortified wine casks and stuff like that. But the aging conditions are almost closer to what you'd find in Kentucky, a little bit sort of harder and faster in terms of the, um, the climate that they're aging in. Well, especially in Tassie, you're going from like, you know, 40 degrees potentially in summer down mm -hmm. to close to zero. So like that's a, a massive range, whereas Scotland's range is definitely, you know, pretty much 15 degrees <laughs> in summer. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. You do, and, and in the same way that you do in Kentucky, obviously it's not exactly the same, but you've got that same thing in Kentucky where you've got cold winters and hot summers. So the casks are a little bit more active from season to season. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, Lark is, uh, Bill Lark is really considered to be, I suppose, the, the godfather of Australian craft whiskey because he was really the first to have that idea. And he taught a lot of people about making whiskey and a lot of the now, you know, hundreds of, of small scale whiskey distilleries that exist in Australia. Uh, a lot of them are based the, the size and shape of their stills off of Lark and their production processes more generally. And most of them have gone down to Tassie at some point and if not sort of worked directly with Bill and the rest of the Lark team at least sort of you know, poked around and got some ideas. Yeah, which is so lovely. Like there's definitely no, there doesn't seem to have been any, like we figured out how to do this and we're gonna just corner the market on it and, you know, pull the ladder up under us that, you know, 
yeah, Phil and, and all, the, you know, Patrick and so on that we'll go on to talk about all seem to be very excited about the fact that there's heaps of kind of young kids now, basically, or kids, but, you know, people our age or whatever that are like, I should open a distillery and they're kind of like, yeah, I, I mean, it's hard work, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. You'll spend 20 years with nobody caring about it um, until you start winning major awards. And that kind of brings us to Sullivan's Cove, which was really another one of the original crew of sort of four or five distilleries that was established in Tasmania in um, the sort of mid to late 1990s into the early 2000s. Uh, so Lark was number one with getting their license in 1992. Sullivan's Cove got their license in 1994. Um, took a slightly different approach in that Sullivan's Cove has always used full size 200 and 300 litre casks, but still with a very, very small scale operation, making really sort of rich and rustic style of single malt from Tasmanian grown barley. And, you know, Sullivan's Cove plugged along for a couple of decades, really, without much interest from anyone. You know, most Australians were still perfectly happy to drink imported single malt Scotch whiskey. Um, but then in 2014, this particular bottle that we have in front of us, Sullivan's Cove French Oak, which is aged in a 300 litre European oak ex tawny casks, which is the Australian style of uh, port That's not style. The actual cask, though, right? This is not the okay, actual I cask like, one. <laughs> I would have been way more careful with it. Yeah, so I'd be auctioning that off right now if it was. Um, yeah, th this particular style of whiskey aged in a 300 litre ex tawny cask, which is Australian port style fortified wine, won best whiskey in the world at the World Whiskies Awards. Uh, sorry, best single malt whiskey in the world at the World Whiskies Awards, which is really the, the premier international awards for single malt whiskey in particular. Yeah. And that really, you know, to be honest, it really changed everything for Australian craft whiskey because all of a sudden, um, you know, Australian whiskies were getting written up in international magazines and websites and there were news crews coming down to Tasmania to interview the Sullivan's Cove guys and it, um, everyone all of a sudden thought to themselves, wow, okay, this Australian whiskey thing is for real. It's not just a couple of guys playing around in the back shed down in Tassie. Yeah, they actually can hold their own on the world stage. Absolutely. And so really from 2014 onwards, that's when you really see an explosion of Australian single malt whiskey happening. Uh, and you start to see sort of bigger, more commercial operations starting to emerge. Um, a lot of investment money coming into the industry and a lot more interest from consumers because yeah. people all of a sudden go, oh, th yeah, this is actually for real. And so the demand for Australian whiskey and Tasmanian whiskey in particular started to increase. The prices started to increase. So you almost have like a Japanese whiskey type effect happening um, with Tasmanian single malt whiskey and then the rest of the Australian industry kind of catches on from there. Because I think that's such a hard thing like we did talk about this um, when we kind of had a had a brief chat about Japanese whiskey in another video um, but people kind of I think sometimes think you know they're like oh like you know Sullivan's Cove like it just sells out straight away what's that about like as if you're you know just stashing it all it's like you're literally selling everything that you had but 20 years ago or you know a bit less than 20 years ago 15 years ago you had no idea you know sure. if you're a distiller you wouldn't you're just not make, making that much because you're making for the demand that your product has at that point and then suddenly the product the demand rockets and you just don't actually have the product and so you know then the prices are going to rise a little bit because obviously if you can finally actually make a little bit of money doing this thing then you know you should do it and because you're trying to expand the business so that you can sort of continue building um so it does always is something that annoys me a little bit when people get a bit hissy about that i'm like well <laughs> there you go preach <laughs> um yeah i'm on your side with that and i think that you know what one of the things that i always tell people when they sort of complain about the uh accessibility or the price of australian craft single malt whiskies is that the scale of most of these operations is tiny and I'm sure that, you know, most of your viewers who are not inside Australia have probably never even heard of most of this stuff because these are not distributed by big multinational companies the way that most Japanese whiskies are, for example. These are not, you know, huge facilities that take up city blocks and, and crank through millions of tons of barley a year. 
they're still passion projects, you know, uh, a lot of them. And, and really only within the last couple of years are we starting to see bigger, more commercial scale distilleries um, emerge in Australia. And, you know, their whiskies tend to be easier to find and at, a, and at a more reasonable price than these tiny little craft guys down in Tassie. Yeah. All right, so that's what's happening in Tasmania. Is that, you know, do they have kind of a monopoly on whiskey in Australia or is there some fun stuff happening elsewhere? It's funny because um, Tasmania has almost ended up like the Highlands of Scotland, where it's sort of where um, the whiskey industry is kind of concentrated and where the modern craft industry sort of started. But yeah, there's plenty of great distilleries on the mainland now as well. One of my favorites uh, we have here is Bakery Hill. And that was the first modern craft distillery to be established back on the mainland. Um, it's, you know, here in Victoria, just on the outskirts of Melbourne. Uh, and of all of the Australian single malt whiskies, this one is probably made in a style that's closest to scotch. Yeah, okay. I think they, um, they tend to rely mostly on ex-bourbon barrels, the way that most scotch whiskey does. So you're really tasting a lot of the grain character rather than a lot of that heavy fortified wine influence that a lot of the Tasmanian whiskies have. Yeah. Um, and they do also use some peated barley that is actually imported from Scotland to get that real nice smokiness in, in some of their releases. Yeah, cool. But, you know, Bakery Hill is still very much on that small craft scale. So they're not making very much whiskey. It's pretty hard to come by. It's pretty expensive when you do come across it. But now we're also starting to see some, some bigger commercial distilleries emerge. Well, I know we have had um, a few uh, viewers sort of comment about the Star Wars whiskey, which has been on the shelf behind me in a few episodes. Pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> it's sorry to disappoint you, but there's no lightsabers. It's Star Word. <laughs> Star Ward, Star Ward. As in towards the stars. Towards the stars. But they kind of are, you know, definitely an example of that. Star Ward really in, in my mind, and I'm sure a lot of other people would agree, was the sort of first commercial scale um, single malt whiskey distillery in Australia in the modern era. So they were established about 10 years ago here in Melbourne with the idea of instead of making something that's sort of like really pretty rare and special like Sullivan's or Lark or Bakery Hill to make something that was a little bit more accessible um, in terms of volume and price point to really be kind of an everyday drinking whiskey, something that you could just crack and, and share with your mates. Yeah. Um, and I think they've done a really good job. They do a really good job. It's yeah, I mean, that's actually what we have in our decanter at home just for your kind of weeknight. Um, yeah, just you know, yum, not necessarily having to sit and think about it too hard, but, but delicious and, and definitely enough going on to be interesting. This is my favorite expression of theirs in Nova, which did just used to be called red wine cask because it was the first time that I saw this. Obviously, Australia is known for its red wine production, like this heaps of it everywhere here. Mm -hmm. um, and again, kind of doing that thing of starting to look in words that, you know, what could be used from Australia rather than sort of relying on what Scotland or um, you know, Kentucky or whatever normally does. Um, and they were one of the first ones that I, that I personally saw from, I mean, I know there's plenty that did it before, but um, kind of arriving here six years ago that, uh, that's, that we're using Aussie red wine casts and it gives it this really kind of interesting, sort of slight tannin um, and quite an elegant sort of structure to it, um, which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember being really excited when Starwood first came out as a cocktail bartender, which I was, you know, still doing at the time because it was the first Australian whiskey that was reasonably priced enough that you could throw it into house cocktails or put it on your cocktail yeah. list. Because as much as I have made a brandy cruster using Sullivan's Cove brandy, I would not be very happy with any of my staff sticking this guy in a, in a cocktail. Yeah, by the way, you owe me half a bottle of brandy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, you're supposed to pay me to come on to the videos. Um, but, and I guess that kind of brings us on to the next thing, which is, you know, what is the face of, of Australian craft whiskey now? It feels like it's finding its own identity a little bit. Um, that's maybe, you know, as much as obviously it has always had its own thing with the smaller barrels and things like that. There's a few other things happening. Yeah, well, I mean, no, you, you make a really good point about the red wine casks with Starwood because um, they weren't the first Australian whiskey to ever use red wine casks, but they were the first one to really focus on that as a style. And it's smart, right? Because it's a clear difference between 
Australian whiskey versus what you might find in Scotland or Kentucky or in Japan because we've got these beautiful red wine casks from the Aussie wine industry, so it's something that you can say very clearly and easily, this is part of the defining style of Australian single malt, and yeah, Starwood Nova, um, a really good example of that. But um, some of the other fun stuff that's happening in Australia now is that we also have not just single malt style whiskies, we've got some other styles of whiskies that are emerging as well because the industry here is so young that we're really able to play around with whatever styles we want. So there are some really interesting whiskies being made with other types of grain as well. My favorite stuff probably coming out of Australia apart from the single malt would be the rye whiskies. Yeah. We've got two different examples of really beautiful rye whiskey here with us today. Uh, one of them is Belgrove, which is another one of these really small craft scale uh, Tasmanian distilleries. I always kind of think like if, if Lark is like the grandfather of the Australian whiskey industry, then Belgrove is like the crazy uncle. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Belgrove they've is... been around for like for a while, but doing yeah. some pretty off the wall stuff. That's it, like Belgrove is absolutely the crazy uncle of Australian whiskey and probably one of the best examples in the world of what craft really means. You know, it's, it's a word that people throw around a lot and, and you know, I've seen production facilities that take up three city blocks that still call themselves craft, but um, Belgrove and Peter Bignall, who is the man behind it, are the sort of ultimate expression of what craft is all about. And really that amazing kind of Tasmanian scene where it's really about the land um, and the stuff that it can produce. So uh, Peter is a farmer. That's you know what his family did and what he did. And so he grows all of his own rye grain right there on his property, as well as making malt whiskey and oat whiskey and several other kinds of things down there as well. Is it not like a, like a sheep dung one? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> one, of the, one of the malt whiskies that, that he made was smoked over sheep shit yep. in, <laughs> instead, of, <laughs> instead of peat, which was standard. But he also, he's the kind of guy, he actually got himself a mining license in order to harvest Tasmanian peat, because technically he's pulling things out of the ground. So he has a mining license just for that reason. He's also an engineer. He's also a champion ice sculptor. <laughs> um, and, and he makes some absolutely beautiful whiskies. He's got one tiny little still uh, with a really old fashioned worm tub condenser, uh, which gives you a really big sort of rustic style of whiskey. And he, fires that still, he runs that still on biofuel, which he is, is basically like used um, deep fryer oil from the, you know, fish and chip shop that's up the road from his farm. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, so you get this amazing kind of direct fired, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit technical, but if you've ever tasted a, a, a single malt scotch, there's still one or two distilleries in Scotland that use direct fired stills and you get this amazing sort of toastiness but he also does things like he makes a peated rye whiskey, right? So he's kind of combining techniques that you would find in Scotland with an American style grain base. And that it's really one of the beautiful things about the Australian whiskey scene is because we don't have those 200 year old traditional production laws, we can kind of experiment and play around and, and make all of these really interesting styles. Yeah, it's fun. It is. Um, he's also, uh, yeah, because like I said, he grows all of his own grain. So it's a true sort of end to end production where he's literally growing the grains himself, um, you know, malting them. He malts it in, a, in an old like industrial tumble dryer from a laundromat and then <laughs> fermenting it himself, distilling it himself. And, and it's sort of like a zero emission kind of closed circle. So that's like the ultimate sort of craft end of yeah. Australian rye whiskey. And then we have the gospel rye, which is made right here in Melbourne, just um, a couple of kilometers that way in a distillery in Brunswick. Also made by an engineer who built his own stills and everything, but um, on a slightly larger scale, uh, really designed to be um, a more commercially viable product. Well, again, that's a fun one. You've seen me use, this is the straight rye, so it's a little bit older, but I have used the Solera rye um, in, in cocktails because, again, it's that bit more accessible. You know, Belgrove is is probably, a, a, you know, if you have a bottle and you feel like experimenting with it, I'm sure it would make 
a delicious, you know, any number of classics. It does. Um, but it is, a, it is a little bit more expensive. So um, the gospel is, again, just bringing it within the reach of, of kind of your, your bartenders and things to have a bit of an experiment with. Absolutely. I think that, you know, the product that they had in mind with the gospel straight rye was something more along the lines of a written house, something that would be your sort of go-to cocktail rye whiskey, but still made from 100% Australian grains. They work with one particular farmer in the Murray Mallee region of South South Australia um, where they get all of their grains from and they are using sort of new American oak barrels in the same way that you would uh, find in rye whiskies coming out of the United States but with the gospel it's just got so much more grain character like yeah. you can really really taste the grains and it's got this beautiful sort of fruitiness Real, to it. Yeah and very spicy. Definitely. Actually we also forgot because um, we do have a bottle but I didn't bring it Speaking of big global awards, it's actually pretty cool because an Australian rye whiskey won best rye whiskey in the world last year. Archie Absolutely, Rose, yeah, the Archie um, Rose from rye up in up in Sydney. So again, you know, it's nice to be recognised. It's like making amazing single malts, making amazing rye whiskey. Sure thing, and and I think that the the common thread throughout all of this is that we do have access to absolutely beautiful grains here in Australia, um, as well as excellent uh, wine casks to to age them in. So yeah, yeah, we're definitely getting some pretty good results across the spectrum. So those are kind of like two opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of like something that's designed to be commercial and accessible and that you can sort of have as an everyday cocktail whiskey. Um, or as a house pour whiskey versus something that's really gonna sit on the top shelf and be pretty experimental and, and out there and absolutely delicious. Yeah. And then I guess kind of to bring it right back round because we did start our, um, our uh, kind of first episode on this, which is more about the history with uh, an acknowledgement of First Nations people and the land that we are lucky enough to live on and that, that can kind of produce all of this. And what's kind of cool now is that people are actually looking at that and looking at native greens and being like, you know, why, why we don't necessarily have to use imported or, sorry, or um, introduced, introduced yeah. um, greens and things. So yeah, I mean, one of the most common questions that I get when I'm talking about Australian whiskey is, um, you know, is anyone using sort of native Australian grains to make whiskey as opposed to barley, which you know, and rye and oats and all that kind of stuff, which are all introduced species. Um, and is anyone using Australian native timber to age the whiskey? Uh, and the answer to both of those questions is yes. Um, Australian native timbers tend like eucalyptus and things like that tend to be quite sort of intense and oily. Um, so they are probably not for everyone in terms of being used to mature whiskey, you know, oak, is the standard for a reason. It works really well, it's delicious, it's flexible. There's a lot of good reasons to use oak casks, but this little guy right here from Old Kempton Distillery, which is another one of those really small, beautiful little craft distilleries down in central Tasmania. As far as I know, this particular bottle of Old Kempton is the first Australian whiskey ever released that has been aged in native timber. So this one was actually aged in a red gum cask. It's so cool. Have you actually tried it? I have tried it, yeah. Um, and I, it's, it's maybe not for everyone. I mean, if you've ever smelled eucalyptus oil, it definitely has that note to it. It's got that quite sort of pungent, oily, sort of thing happening. Um, I actually really enjoyed it though. I thought it was pretty delicious. Maybe not for your everyday drinking whiskey, but as a really interesting curiosity. Well, I think as well, like I've spoken about it a bit sometimes with Australian gins and things, that eucalypt note is something that I just, is just like, is in the land here, you know? Absolutely. And stuff is you. So it's nice, I think, that maybe from drinking Aussie gins, Aussie Amari and that kind of thing, people might get more used to that note and then be able to kind of have it in their whiskey and stuff and enjoy it for what it is rather than being like this doesn't taste like how whiskey should you know yeah exactly um and uh, i think it's i think it's super cool because it is a, a an obvious sort of point of difference you certainly wouldn't taste that note and think that it tastes like whiskey from anywhere else like you said yeah. but i think what will probably end up happening with these native timbers is rather than them being used in large scale to produce australian whiskey 
It might end up being similar to the way that Japanese oak is used in Japanese whiskey, basically as an additive in, yeah. in small amounts. So you get a whiff of you that get, like, note. You like your Mizunara finished whiskey it, and things like that. Exactly, than, yeah. so you get that sort of Mizunara note in the whiskey rather than it being an overpowering thing. Um, so hopefully we see more of that. I know Sullivan's Cove have got some native timber casks just a couple of them though, so it's really all still pretty experimental, but people are starting to play around with that. Yeah. And then as you said, to sort of bring it all the way back around um, to sort of native grains and, uh, you know, Australia's first peoples and traditional owners and stuff, um, we have the Adelaide Hills Distillery Native Grain Project. This is the second edition of their native grain project. The first one that they made was using wattle seed, a really common tree here in Australia that drops quite a lot of seeds that have a sort of coffee chocolate little note to them. It's so delicious, hey. It's really good. And then this is the second edition which is made um, with a small portion of weeping grass that's been co-fermented with the barley. So it's majority barley, but it's got a significant portion of weeping grass in there as well. Um, and weeping grass is a really interesting one because I think that for really the last couple of hundred years we've been telling ourselves this story in Australia that there was not a lot of agriculture happening here before European colonization, but recent scholarship has showed us that that's actually not true and that there was significant deliberate sort of agriculture and the raising and collecting and storage of grains uh, being done by Aboriginal Australians well before, you know, thousands and thousands of years before European colonisation. So weeping grass would have been one of those things. And Adelaide Hills Distillery is really interested in, you know, sort of making use of some of those native grains and incorporating them into their whiskey. So with this one in particular, it's been aged in a 300 litre French oak red wine casks, so Australian red wine casks. Um, and the weeping grass really ends up sort of behaving a little bit like rye whiskey. You get this really interesting sort of spicy character from it that really adds a, a whole nother dimension um, to what would otherwise just be a straight single malt whiskey. So it's all looking pretty exciting. Do you see that, you know, do you reckon that we're gonna kind of continue to see a growth in Australian whiskey? You think we're kind of poised for world dom domination at this point? Well, I would really love to see Australian whiskey take its sort of deserved place um, on the shelf of whiskey bars all over the world next to Canadian whiskey, Japanese whiskey, Irish whiskey. I think that we're still probably a couple of hundred years behind the Scots in terms <laughs> of world domination, but uh, especially now that we're seeing the commercial side of Australian whiskey develop, uh, you know, bigger distilleries that can produce more product at a more reasonable price um, to hopefully uh, spread that out around the world. Um, and I'm really excited to see over the next sort of 10, 20, 30 years, some of those native grains be developed as well into more commercial crops that can actually be sort of harvested in larger quantities and, and really sort of lock down some of those styles that are gonna be unique to Australia. Yeah, that's, it's definitely a pretty exciting time and delicious time. Absolutely. Uh, now, we're probably going to leave that there. I know that I do do this to you guys um, that are over in the States sometimes where I talk about all of these delicious products that you can't get. But there are actually a few of these um, Star Wars you can definitely get um, in the States. Um, Sullivan's Cove and Lark, you can, but from like two shops. <laughs> yeah, you basically want to look for, for boutique whiskey shops on the coasts. Yeah. Um, but I do think that the Gospel are also planning on uh, on kind of expanding over there as well. Although that'll probably be an interesting one coming up against your, your native rise, but you know, we'll see. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, 78 Degrees are also, I think, in their, um, their kind of vision for their business is world domination. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if you see some of that over there. So at some point soon um, but yeah definitely the star would keep a little eye out for because it's it's really delicious and a, a lovely introduction to the style of things that you can get here as always please subscribe and hit that notification bell because next up we're gonna have Fred tapping into his childhood a little bit to uh, to show us one of his favorite um, Australian whiskey cocktails and we'll be answering some questions from our Patreons as well for a little bit more insight uh, or more specific insights into the world of Australian whiskey. 
So thank you very much for joining us and imparting your knowledge. And I think there's only one thing left to see. Ooh, uh, so now you know. He doesn't say it as good as me. <laughs> <laughs>